Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our sixth in this series of presentations on findings from our Emerging Technologies Research Study for 2022-2023. I'm Jerry Murphy, Senior Vice President of Research and Consulting for uh, Numerities Research. Uh, this final talk is going to be on uh, the trends that we found in security and privacy. Uh, to recap, uh, we interviewed uh, 20 people from different firms, over 10 vertical industries. These are large companies uh, across the spectrum, uh, really talking to them about their use of emerging technologies. Uh, generally, we're looking at benchmarking bellwether emerging technologies with live interviews, uh, anywhere from 45 minutes to two hours, talking to people about the details of their use of technologies uh, and the maturity of their company being prepared to use those technologies. Uh, we looked across 10 broad areas and today, our final presentation, we're gonna be focused on our findings in security uh, and privacy. By far the one that had the most uh, participation and the most uh, insights and feedback from the people we talked to. Our definition of security and privacy and next generation cybersecurity and privacy practices and technologies that include, but are not limited to certainly zero trust, software defined perimeter and collaboration security. When we talk about bellwether technologies, what we mean there are selected technologies that we felt represent progress in a particular area. Certainly the intention wasn't to have a complete comprehensive, complete look at every single emerging technology in this area, sort of our ability to do a quick and dirty assessment in these areas. Uh, and that's what these represented. Um, what we actually looked at when we were uh, assessing people's maturity, we were looking sort of at three bro broad areas. One is technology state of adoption. Are they actually using a specific technology? The second thing we looked at was whether or not people were using the technology, their perceived values of those technologies. And then the last, those remaining seven or eight areas were sort of like the process and people around that. Do you have staff? Do you have funding? Do you have key performance indicators? Uh, do you have governance? Uh, things along those natures. Some of the key findings, just getting to it. Security certainly is very uh, mature across most companies. Everybody thinks security is important. Everybody has budgets, training, uh, some level of type of security architecture. The interesting thing though is about 25% of the people don't perceive value in security technology. Now, what we saw by that, that certainly doesn't mean there's no value of any security technology. Clearly people think security is necessary, very important. But at the same time, people are not just simply jumping into any new security technology just because some vendor says, hey, I've got this new thing. People have to be able to demonstrate the value of that technology. One thing that happens is there's so much importance in security. There's so many vendors there that people are like, wait a second, let me understand how that ties into all the other security things I have. Is it something that's actually going to make things better or is it just going to make things more uh, complex uh, and harder. So uh, that's kind of one of the things I saw there too. AI, artificial intelligence, there's a very big use of artificial intelligence and people actually see the value of it when it comes to things like anomaly detection. I think it's too much to say I'm going to use artificial intelligence to actually pinpoint the root cause of any specific security issue, but people are definitely seeing it as if I've got this big stack of hay and I'm trying to find a needle in a haystack, while it's not necessarily gonna make me find the needle because I don't even know what the needle may look like in terms of a new security threat, but I can certainly use AI to get rid of the hay, right? So uh, I think it's very helpful there. Zero trust is a term that's used over and over again. It's an emerging architecture. I mean, it was coined a few years ago uh, by Forrester, and you're starting to see a lot of people using it today. Certainly NIST has standards for zero trust. The president you know, issued a proclamation a few months ago saying anybody dealing with the government has to have some uh, vision of going towards uh, zero trust. Uh, but you, what you're not seeing 
is people wholesale replacing what they've got with zero trust more what we're seeing is people saying yes it's an aspirational target i understand its importance but i'm going to as i put new pieces into my architecture those new pieces will be zero trust capable but uh i'm going to sort of go through it as it makes sense not just simply throw out everything I've got. Um, I think some of the thing reason why people don't rush into security is security is something that's part of risk management. And so while I'm concerned about security, I also am cautious about any claims about new security products and features and functions. So because people are hesitant about things with security, it also means they're hesitant in simply jumping into new security technology at the same time. And of anything that might be lagging in security, one of the things we're seeing there maybe is social media. Uh, because while people, I think, are trying to figure out how to use social media, integrating into my company, it's not just a distraction of employees who want to be on social media instead of doing work. It's actually how do I use social media to advertise my products, integrate things my employees are doing, um, and because it's something that people are, are trying to figure out how to embrace, they're not necessarily uh, putting security as a first and foremost consideration in embracing social media. And because of that, it's probably the area that um, has the least um, security considerations today. Now, something we've gone through a few times before, I'll just touch on briefly here on the numerities maturity model. When we look at are people prepared for new technology, there's sort of four levels. On the far left is unprepared, where people just don't have the right information to take action, to reactive, which is I am seeing issues and I'm dealing with them, but I deal with them as they come up. Proactive is I have platforms to take care of issues today and anticipatory is not only do I have platforms and processes and people that are handling things today, but I'm looking at what's coming tomorrow and I'm putting budget, I'm putting processes uh, and organization in place to take care of what I think is going to be coming uh, tomorrow. In security and privacy, mostly people are pretty uh, well prepared. And, and when you looked at what I said before in terms of adopting technology, versus people and process, almost everybody has people and process and budget in place for new security technologies. Uh, it's more that they're not necessarily adopting all new technologies just because they come up. Now, these are the six particular technologies that we looked at specifically in security and privacy. Zero trust, software to prime perimeter slash zero trust network architecture, explicit nation state threat monitoring, collaboration, social media security, internet of things, uh, asset management and security, and API management and security. Uh, as I mentioned before, probably collaboration and social media is the one that's sort of uh, least sophisticated in terms of uh, security considerations. Now, when you look at maturity overall, as you can see uh, across the bottom eight areas that are really, do I have teams, process, and people pretty well for most things. Uh, people are pretty anticipatory and are very concerned about having training, having people, having key performance indicators, having defined governance, very strong in the security space. If you look at unprepared, you know, technology state adoption, and, and here you got to use unprepared, which is how many of these new technology are they using? And for some people, they would argue it is not that I'm unprepared. It's just I'm not necessarily going to use any new technology, uh, zero trust being one. People understand the architecture, but they're not simply throwing out all the old stuff to put zero trust in uh, for everything. And also in terms of realized value, people are not just saying because it's new, I perceive value. In security, people need to be shown and have to be convinced there's some demonstrated actual 
benefit of putting in some new technology in security before they're going to simply uh, put it in. These are some of the comments that we receive from people in security. Uh, and as you can see across the board, I'm not going to uh, read all these. You can all read. Uh, number one in almost all areas, that's big, very important for people. Um, security hated wireless. It's interesting to see things like 5G on uh, any new technology around wireless security, what's going on there. Uh, but across the board, very high, people looking at it, top priorities, super important now. Uh, I think we get the picture there. Very, very important. Everybody agrees. Now, when you look at specific areas, as you can see here in Zero Trust, about half the people are using now, and even the people who are using it now aren't using it 100%. I think out of all the people uh, that we talked with, I think I found one company that would say they're 100% uh, Zero Trust. Uh, interesting thing there from my perspective was the person that was saying they were embracing Zero Trust 100% was educational institution, which I thought was kind of interesting because educational institutions tend to be more when in doubt share information as opposed to when in doubt protect information. Uh, but when you look at the way their networks are set up, I think educational institutions networks are set up, they tend to be flatter and they tend to be more aligned with implementing uh, zero trust uh, architectures. Uh, perceived value, pretty much the same thing. It's like, it's interesting to see half using it and half with perceived value. I don't know that you can necessarily assume though that if they're using it, they're perceiving value. And if they're not using it, they haven't perceived value. Uh, be look interesting to see a little bit more whether that is actually uh, the case there. When it comes to um, SDP, about 40% of the people using it. Um, I'm actually seeing, interesting, you see they're 25% planning it. So between people who are using it and people planning on using it this year, uh, you're close to uh, 70%. So is, SDP is something that people are definitely using or planning uh, to use this year. And people are generally, when you see what the perceived value is, it's um, what 90% of the people are either saying there's value or pretty consistent uh, value there in using SDP. Nation state threat monitoring, 75%. Now, we had a lot of financial institutions we talked to. Certainly financial institutions are absolutely doing nation state threat monitoring. I think less so in maybe educational institution settings, but most of your businesses uh, are certainly concerned about that. Collaboration, social media, you can see there about 50% using it, 33% not considering using it. Uh, from our perspective, that maybe is a little bit of a mistake. I think people certainly need to look at putting security in in all areas. Uh, I don't know if people are perceiving a balance between security and privacy when it comes to things like uh, social media. Uh, but uh, from our perspective, I think people certainly need to be considering it uh, more. For the most part, people are seeing value in that, just less so in the implementation side. Internet of Things, uh, management uh, and security. Again, more than half the people are using it. People definitely perceive value in it for the most part. 11% saying it was not understood or hard to measure 11% don't know. Uh, and I think part of that is because Internet of Things is still something that's not ubiquitous and people are still trying to figure out how does Internet of Things fit into, you know, business models. So I think you'll, you're you going to see as, as IoT gets more mature itself, you're going to see more security there. But certainly uh, people who are trying to hack into systems are looking at IoT as a way that they can get into systems. So I think you're gonna see in the coming years, there will be more and more security play there, uh, more than there is today. API management, certainly that's something that's very, very prevalent, people recognize. And it's very important, especially when you look at people going from building their own apps to 
software as a service where I'm getting my business applications from third parties like, you know, Salesforce um, and, and companies like that, that are, that are really uh, service now, you know, their applications, even Microsoft, right. Where people went from having exchange on, on site to having office 365. It's really important to have, you know, I'm running my business by APIs between these applications and security absolutely has to be nailed uh, there and people understand it and are really, you know, obviously pushing that pretty hard. Teams, as you can see here, everybody's got teams that are focused on security, not necessarily next generation security, but certainly, you know, security as it exists today. People absolutely have use cases for it. Everybody's got budget for security and for the most part, metrics and KPIs and where there's an evaluation, I think it's evaluating metrics and KPIs for new security, not necessarily existing. If it's something that's in place today, people certainly have metrics and key performance indicators for that. Training, everybody's got training. And that is one thing I will say when I, when I talk to clients, uh, in the last four or five years, people made a dramatic improvement on where it used to be security was, oh, I got to do it every year. People check the box. People are much more proactive in security and not only doing training and doing training more frequently, but people are doing, you know, penetration testing. People are sending uh, emails that intentionally have spam that they're testing to see if people are clicking on links for spear phishing. I'll, you know, there's much more ubiquitous understanding that I can't just do it once a year. It's got to be built. Awareness has to be constantly built into the DNA of our employees and that uh, people have made significant progress in the last few years. Uh, are people revising operations to take advantage of it and having strategies for integrating it? You know, by and large, yes. Where it's Planning, and again, the planning is for this year. So, you know, people have it at the top of their viewpoint. And certainly strategy for security is there. Uh, what are the use cases? As you can see here, validating new technology, more and more proof of concepts. You're seeing a lot more people having um, sandboxes. So if I have some new application, some new business process, instead of just throwing it in my existing architecture, sandboxing it, putting in a replicated environment, checking not just how does it work functionally, but are there any uh, security issues with uh, some new things? Interesting thing here, debating where the edge of concern should be. And I think that's one of the things between having zero trust architectures as a concept combined with the pandemic causing so many employees working from home. It used to be I had my data center, I had my business, I had my desktop computers that were in my company and I had my lands, I had my data centers. Now people, my workers could be at Starbucks, they could be at their house, they could be at a client site. I have software as a service companies that I don't even, you know, their, their applications and infrastructure like a black box to me, you know, where is the edge of what I'm responsible for versus somebody else. I think that's something that you're gonna to continue to have conversations on. Where is the boundary of my enterprise? And because there's that question, I think that's one of the reasons that zero trust architectures make sense. Because instead of saying, here's the defined borders of my enterprise, everything in it's protected, everything outside I don't care about or, or I'm not concerned about. It's really what I'm protecting is the data. So wherever the data is, that's what's protected. And I'm going to protect and validate anybody accessing data. One needs to have a need for that data in an appropriate time. Uh, and only when they need it, do I give them access. And so if I focus on protecting the data and who gets access to it in a given time, then there's less of a concern of where they are. And it's more, you know, when I need it, uh, and when you think about it that way, it kind of makes sense that a zero trust network architecture is the kind of thing that's going to make sense for people to migrate to. Okay, so that's what we saw on security. 
Uh, I, I hope that those of you who have participated have found these briefings useful and insightful. Uh, you will be able to see all of these webinars. We did all six uh, episodes are available on either Bright Talk or uh, you can go to namiris.com. You can join our community. If you go to namiris.com forward slash community, you can join our community request access. It's pretty straightforward to do. And when you get access uh, to our community, it's a bunch of uh, information technology professionals. We have a, various different areas, whether it's cybersecurity, distributed work, workforce, digital transformation, different areas that you might be interested in. Uh, we will have these slides in the appropriate sections there as well. All you got to do is uh, request join and uh, you can get access to that. And with that, um, that's what we have. I'm happy to take any questions that anybody uh, might have uh, at this time. Wait a minute for any questions anybody might have. All right, I am not seeing any questions. And with that, I appreciate everybody's time and attention. We look forward to seeing you on future webinars. If you're wondering when they are, you can always visit uh, numerities.com and see information on when we'll have any uh, upcoming webinars, upcoming seminars on other emerging technologies uh, that will be available for you to see. And with that, uh, thank everybody for participating and I hope everybody has a great rest of their day.